Hello, <coughs> I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi. We're back with Dr. Judy Radson, Associate Professor of Medicine at University of Miami, and now we're going to discuss the management of a non stem cell transplant candidate patient with multiple myeloma. Hello. Hi, Tony. Thank you. So, Dr. Ratson, assuming a patient is not a candidate for whatever reason for a stem cell transplant with multiple myeloma, what happens next with that patient? Well, the patient would get treated. Um, and the treatment today certainly has prolonged life compared mm -hmm. to the treatment that we had years ago. So the, the question would be, you know, what to treat that patient mm -hmm. with. An initial mm -hmm. treatment, again, is probably not all that different from the kind of treatment we would give the patient who's going to be a stem cell um, candidate. If we find the patient has um, low counts or there's or needs some immediate immediate treatment, we might start just with uh, dexamethasone mm -hmm. or dexamethasone and bortezomib. Mm -hmm. um, if the patient is quite stable, we might start with um, with Revlimid and um, dexamethasone. So those would be my, my general choices. If it's a really elderly person mm -hmm. um, or someone with really bad <coughs> neuropathy mm -hmm. um, that I didn't want to give the bortezomib or the Revlimid to because mm -hmm. of of their neuropathy or they've got some other underlying problem causing neuropathy, uh, I might give that person the older treatment, melphalan mm -hmm. and prednisone. Mm -hmm. So it, it depends on what their clinical status is. So let's just take a step back. Why would someone not be a candidate for a stem cell transplant? Um, well, age might be one reason. Mm -hmm. As I said in one of the earlier videos, uh, age does not necessarily rule out transplant, and we don't mm -hmm. just do it in younger people. But if one has an 85, 90-year-old person, the the transplant treatment really would be too difficult for them to tolerate. So age mm -hmm. is relative, but would figure in as one reason why one might not do it. Mm -hmm. um, there. <coughs> Unfortunately, there may be other reasons, such as insurance coverage mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. for this, um, since it's an expensive kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. That might be another reason why one might not be able to right. do it. The patient may choose not to have transplant. Might be another reason why transplant would not be mm -hmm. a consideration. Um, they may have have other comorbid diseases that mm -hmm. would prevent our considering the patient for transplant. Sure, sure. So what we call the biology of the... Uh, what about the performance status of the patient? How does that change your management? Someone who's actively playing tennis versus someone who's in bed all the time? Um, well, certainly that would be... A person who's in bed all the time, I'd probably be less likely to consider a very aggressive therapy because mm -hmm. I think they would probably die from the therapy. Mm -hmm. A person who's out playing tennis and has really good performance status is someone that you would want to consider more mm -hmm. aggressive therapy because um, you would want to give them as long a time mm -hmm. as possible. <clears throat> How do you address areas of pain? Well, areas of pain, one, if, if one really has a focal area of pain that is not due to a pathologic fracture or not due to a uh, compression fracture of the vertebrae, mm -hmm. but a, a rib or something, something of that sort, then little local radiation mm -hmm. can be very effective in, in treating that. Mm -hmm. uh, if one has something that does need surgical addressing, then surgery would be um, they have a pathologic fracture, they have in, impending compression fractures mm -hmm. that need to be addressed, then the surgeon is very helpful there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What about the use of narcotics? Do you advocate that in someone who has pain? Well, yes. Uh, I think it's very important when someone has real pain mm -hmm. from um, malignancy like this that you at least showed the patient that you can get them free of pain mm -hmm. with the proper use of pain medication. But since the pain is something that will be ongoing unless you treat it or mm -hmm. treat the underlying cause, 
you know, I like to give the pain medication at the same time we're addressing the cause of the pain so that one can eventually mm -hmm, mm -hmm. get them off the pain medication so they can lead a more normal life. Mm -hmm. Are there any medicines that protect the bone that can be used in myeloma? Yes, um, and I should have said this earlier because early on one of the important things uh, to use are the biphosphonates. Uh, mm -hmm. if if possible, if someone has bad renal disease, um, then it limits our use of biphosphonates. But certainly this can has been shown to help strengthen the bone in, in patients with myeloma who frequently have osteoporosis, osteopenia. It may help too in preventing some of the um, orthopedic issues that one has with bone. <clears throat> now, if a patient develops kidney failure from the myeloma, would you recommend dialysis for that patient? Yes. Okay. What if the calcium level becomes very elevated? How do you address that? Well, again, the biphosphonates are usually very helpful in controlling calcium levels in patients with myeloma. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I didn't say when we just talked about the biphosphonates, usually one gives that for a, a limited period of time. A, about two years. If they develop um, hypercalcemia after that, one can again give a short course of the mm -hmm. biphosphonates and in, in attempt to control it. There are other agents one uses as well, such as steroids, um, um, calcitonin. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are other medications mm -hmm. that one uses to treat the acute um, episode of hypercalcemia. And certainly, fluid. Um, and um, saline diuresis is an important part mm -hmm. of that. What about the issue of issues with the jaw and the use of bisphosphonates? What is that? Well, there's been noted to be um, an increased incidence of osteonecrosis of the jaw mm -hmm. in patients given bisphosphonates, not just for multiple myeloma, but for mm -hmm. osteoporosis, mm -hmm. osteopenia in general. Uh, and it's <coughs> been with almost all the bisphosphonates, oral and um, um, the IV, and this particularly uh, becomes a problem if the patient has to have dental mm -hmm. surgery, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. we're we're very careful now in before we start patients on bisphosphonates and making sure that they see their dentist, they have any, everything taken care of that they need to take care mm -hmm. of. If they develop a dental problem while on the bisphosphonate, we stop it, hold mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. for a period of time to, so that they can then get their dental care and then we wait until we re to restart it. I see. Well, what are your thoughts on the use of al alternative herbal medicines concurrently with our treatments? Well, that's, uh, that's a good question because I think we all know that um, whether they tell us or not mm -hmm. that many patients take a lot of, um, of herbal mm -hmm. medications or medicines that people get from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of these we have no idea what they are and what their potential benefit or harm um, may be. Mm -hmm. uh, I always try to get people to tell me what they're taking mm -hmm. and s see whether there's anything in that they're taking that might conflict with the medication that we're giving. A part of me uh, has always believed that it's important for patients to maintain a certain type of control and mm -hmm. doing this does give them mm -hmm. some control over uh, over their disease. Mm -hmm. And if it's something I think is harmless, you know, then I say go ahead and take it. But I, I try and get an honest mm -hmm. um, exchange going on as to what they're taking and not taking. Yeah, so at the very least we like to know mm -hmm. what they're... Uh, why do you address nausea and vomiting related to the therapies that we give? Well, with with the medications for um, multiple myeloma, there's relatively little in the way of nausea and vomiting unless it's in the transplant stage. <coughs> mm -hmm. For the regu regular medications that we give, it's really not an issue. Mm -hmm. But um, in general, in, as far as nausea and vomiting, if, if we have medications that we feel are highly likely to cause mm -hmm, nausea and vomiting, mm -hmm. then when we give it, we give it with medication to counteract that, such as Zofran, Compazine, Emend for mm -hmm. delayed um, um, nausea and vomiting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But a lot depends on what the drugs are and how likely they are to cause that, whether we use those drugs. Oh, I see. <clears throat> what if the patient has no appetite? How do you address that? Well. 
that might be from depression. So mm -hmm. that's one issue to to determine why the patient may not have appetite. Mm -hmm. They may not have appetite because of the medications that they're taking may depress their appetite. In general, we treat patients with myeloma with uh, high doses of dexamethasone on a consistent basis, and that usually acts as an appetite stimulant. Mm -hmm. And so, in general, that's probably not too much of an issue. If they do have problems, one can consider Depending on what other drugs they're taking, an appetite stimulant such mm -hmm. as Megase, one would want to be careful if they're also on a drug like Revlimid, which can cause thromboses, and, and Megase may cause thromboses. Uh, and so one would want to be careful what drugs you're, mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. putting together. I see. What are your thoughts on palliative care in hospice in terminal stage patients? Well, I think that hospice plays a very important role. Role. And I think it's important as physicians to have the conversation with patients when we can no longer offer them something that's going to improve their quality of life. And palliative care and hospice may at least make the end of life more comfortable for them. And so I think we, we have to have those conversations mm -hmm. with patients. Um, sometimes patients don't want to hear it and don't want to have the conversation. And other times they're very willing and happy mm -hmm. to stop the the attempt at trying to be treated with drugs that aren't making them, giving them side effects and not helping them, uh, and are willing to accept hospice. Mm -hmm. But I think, it, obviously, it's not something you order for a patient. It's mm -hmm. something that mm -hmm. you have to have an agreement with the patient that this is where they're at at that point. What if the patient is not ready to discuss that, but you know they need to discuss it? How do you address that situation? Well, that's hard if they're not, I mean, I, you bring it up and if they tell you they're not ready, you tell them that you're there to talk to them about it. I mean, it's, it's a decision that you cannot make for the patient. Mm -hmm. They have to make for themselves. What about when oftentimes the families ask us not to discuss the prognosis or the disease with the patient? How do you address that? That's, that's happening less and less. Mm -hmm. I, I, in general, um, I don't always like to discuss absolute prognosis because I can tell you what's going to happen to a large group of people and how likely a large group is going to live a certain mm -hmm. amount, but I really can't tell in the individual mm -hmm. case. And so I hate to say you're going to live this amount of time mm -hmm. with this treatment. It's not something that um, one can really honestly say. So I, I tell them, that for an individual person, I can't really tell you. Mm -hmm. I can tell the prognosis for a large group, but I can't tell you that your prognosis may be better than the group and it may be worse than the group. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think you, I, I don't like to dwell on prognosis with the patient. Mm -hmm. I like to dwell, I like the patient though to understand their disease mm -hmm. and um, why we're treating them the way they are and what the disease is, and that's what I tell the family. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. We hope this has been educational for you.